one is kind of like how the brain started to uh, be affected by nutrients and how it kind of opened the door to enlarge the brain and then why these drugs work, why things that plants work make in the brain, why things that plants make work in the human brain. Kind of my brain doesn't work for a second there. And uh, the, um, welcome. And, the uh, and then I kind of take it into uh, as the development of uh, um, synthesis, organic synthesis of molecules, and then towards finally where we make nootropics and how they came about in this accidental discovery. And you'll see that it kind of comes back around. So uh, we're going to start here. Okay, so uh, this is a quote from the father of the nootropic concept, Cornelia Gurdja. So he was a, a Romanian uh, neuropharmacologist in a lab in Belgium. And so they kind of found this category by accident, but this quote, which was originally in his first paper, was actually in French for some reason, uh, you know, kind of speaks to the idea of the nootropic concept and kind of what I believe in and why I've dedicated my life and my time and my business and everything I do to furthering the nootropic concept. And so basically is man will not wait passively for millions of years for evolution off from the brain. So the idea is that the brain, it's evolved over millions of years, but as you'll see in the next few slides, that it took its fits and spurts and it depended on the uh, type of uh, nutrients available and different things, but that the brain uh, growth doesn't always follow the evolutionary path. It's actually sometimes something called XF, uh, which I'll get into, but it's basically where the brain grew and then we became creative. And so the question and like what I posit about nootropics is that they may be this tool to open up our mind to greater abilities, and the question is what will we do with them? So, um, so this is kind of what I just said about the fits and spurts. So here's kind of actually where we come in, which is like 1.6 million to 2.2 uh, 2 million years ago. So that's Homo habilis. We are sapiens up here. Neanderthals actually had a little bit bigger brains, but they didn't have something called symbolic consciousness, which is actually like the ability to like sing and dance and like create art. They were kind of bland. And so um, that exaptation is that idea is that we're going to see that there was nutrients, specifically humans being around uh, fish and marine life that allowed for the dramatic growth in the brain. And that actually then allowed for everything about humanity to kind of come forward afterwards. Uh, yes, George, real quick. Yeah, real quick. How do you know that Neanderthal didn't have the ability to sing and dance? They didn't leave anything around. They didn't have flutes and instruments that they found within the Homo sapiens. And actually, in the uh, in words, uh, there you go. Huh? Okay, so yes, yeah, so they actually. Um, so yeah, so they basically a lot of the evidence of these humans being uh, around the ocean and this marine had is all the settlements are kind of washed away because we were on the edge of the ocean. So it was kind of a reason why that like savanna hypothesis of apes. Uh, becoming living in the savanna, but if you actually look at humans, we're hairless, we have sweat glands, we have fat, we have we urinate a lot, we don't have fur to reflect the sun, and we don't have good water retention uh, or capacity to hold water like camels or other animals. So and zebras and things like that. So we basically had to be by water all the time. And so what it likely seems is that, and if you actually, you know, they have the guys from uh, you know, the video they show, there's a video where they show apes walking in the river and that's likely the first steps that humans took was like, in, you know, how easy it is to walk in water. So uh, we kind of uh, have all these things, if you look at your body, if you ever wonder, for example, and this is in the book, why your hands prune, it's not because you've been in the tub too long, your mom says, get out of there, you're gonna turn into a prune, it's because it increased your grip. And so we have all this evolution that has to do with water and being shore-based uh, animals. And so the actual interesting thing is that in humans eating grass and things, we can convert, um, and most animals can convert the omega-3 in the uh, grass into DHA, which is brain nutrient. And so if you actually look at animals, at so like the ratio of their body weight to brain weight, squirrels are actually have a better ratio than, than like rhinos and hippos. Because as you get bigger, and even gorillas and chimps, like a baby has a brain that's basically the size of a, a chimp. Uh, the problem is, is they can't, their tissue, their protein grows at a greater rate than their brain size. So actually, there's not on this chart, but the idea that they use is there's a dolphin, is like somewhere right here, where the dolphin, because they're eating fish all the time, has a ratio in the similar weight. So this is the idea is that 
with these nutrients kind of allow our brain to grow bigger and our brain, and there's like all these, uh, all these stats and things, um, and this is basically, there's something called, um, basically like a, a quotient uh, for the encephalization, which is the growth in the size of the brain. So if you look at, these are all those uh, other ones, here's Homo sapiens, here's Neanderthals, you can see the ratio of body weight to your brain size, it kind of keeps getting bigger as you go up, and that's, we have actually a huge advantage over the Neanderthals, and this is actually when you take the fat out of the calculation for humans, because we don't, most an, other animals don't really store fat like we do, we actually have an even bigger uh, quotient here. So, it, basically our brain was, uh, stores fat and then uses that fat, our body stores that fat and then uses it later on to grow our brain. That's why babies require so much fat and like breast milk is like 70% fat. Um, and so it's basically, uh, this idea is that these fish and vertebrates that are available as our source of food helped our brain grow and then everything else kind of came afterward. So we're gonna look at like why, you know, these things that are just in nature, how do they uh, affect the brain? And so this is actually, this was actually my worst talk ever was when I tried to do this book, Plants in the Human Brain, it's so complex. Um, but uh, I've simplified it a lot now, and it's basically uh, humans and uh, bees, and bugs and plants, we are all eukaryotes. And so there's actually, this slide here <coughs> shows, hey buddy, um, we are also, <laughs> the dogs are here somewhere, um, but basically uh, eukaryotes, this line of uh, the world, and uh, the, the tree of life, we share with them. And so um, we basically have these, Slide. But so yeah, so we actually share with with the plants and the animals a lot of g very small, like important genes. There's 4,000 genes we sell uh, have in common with a, pro a protist single cell organism. Uh, we have 3,400 uh, that are like in this common area, and there's 3,000 per plant. So there's actually like a lot of the, and that stuff that is there are core their core functions of the brain, so like the calcium-gated channels and things like that. So what's really neat about the plants and animals though is that they were actually evolving, plants evolved with very little with, in, in mind with humans and actually a lot involved with animals. Okay, I guess we're going forward. Um, sorry. Can we go back? Oh, there we go. Rose out. Um, back. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, you can go, go, yeah, go back. So this is, this is actually the coolest thing I learned about uh, plants and what they're making. So plants are in this like epic struggle between predators and, uh, and, and herbivore uh, like people to like help, uh, bugs to help spread their seeds and their pollen and other things. So they want to reward, but they don't want to reward too much. And they want to, and so they also like can punish. So there's actually, like if a plant gets attacked, it can release pheromones that will bring a, pre a predator for that bug. They can also, like their antioxidants, like the L-theanine, which in, is in my nootropics, that's in the leaf of a green tea as an antioxidant. It's made in the roots, it's sent up there. And things like caffeine are found in the leaf because they're poisonous to lower level bugs. But then for a pollinator like a bee, who has a different, a much more complex brain, actually similar to ours, closer to ours, they uh, get that same reward that we get, where it reminds you of where the plant is, it stimulates you to come back, and it also actually inhibits your appetite a little bit, which is good in that case. And you can actually look at like opiates and all the other kind of drugs that plants make and see how like, oh, if someone's on heroin, they don't like to eat, they don't reproduce, that's great if that bug's trying to eat you. So the plants are actually drugging the bugs in the same way it affects humans. So you can kind of like see that we should just not do some of these drugs because they are specifically designed to like make you out of the gene pool and unproductive. Uh, okay, so we saw that. Okay, so uh, so actually the plants and the humans, they, this is kind of tied together in the book a lot more tightly, but these plants are making all sorts of molecules like this to communicate themselves. And so they, they have, uh, you know, they have, there's two different main types of receptors, and basically the plant neurotransmitters like acetylcholine and GABA, they're in the plant as well. And so the plant is actually thinking, it's not really thinking in the same way, um, but plants do have some uh, intelligence between them, especially 
um, in a group where, like, for example, if the zebras are eating a type of plant, the plant will release that pheromone to like tell the other plants to start making a poison, and the zebras actually even know this, and they'll attack from downwind or upwind so that the, the pheromones and things won't flow over to the uh, to the to the other plants. So we're going to look at kind of this kind of idea here is that um, that these molecules are functioning in a way. Uh, between the two of us, and that's kind of the link between the plants and the human brain, and you've got the expectation um, where the things are occurring and then the function and form comes afterwards. So it's this other less talked about part of Darwin's theory of evolution where it doesn't actually like happen uh, as a survival of the fittest, it happens because of kind of what we have. And so I think I've hammered that away, so we look at the reward molecules, and so we look at caffeine as a great example. Um, it's actually in a, over 100 different plants in 13 different orders. It's evolved five times. So it's kind of what happens is that the plant has this molecule, and then there's hundreds of millions of years of the plants just sitting around, and they doubled and doubled. It's called a DNA duplication. And so they had like an exact working set of their DNA, and so then there's all this room for new things to evolve out, except that it's not, it's not necessary for the plant. So you get this molecule, which is very similar, um, this is a purine, this is a denosine, and this is caffeine. So caffeine works actually by, in your brain, a simple way to say it is that as you're awake, adenosine starts to fill uh, like these slots up. And once you're a bank of adenosine is kind of full, you're just tired. That's it. When you go to sleep, you kind of unwind that and reset it. Caffeine sits in that same slot. You see that core molecule, and it blocks the adenosine. And so you just don't get tired. And so you guys know all the effects of caffeine. So uh, I like caffeine because it's kind of all over. We got little bees getting high on caffeine and humans as well. Um, you can put plants out and you can see there's a certain level where they, uh, the nectar has a low dose caffeine, any higher will kill them. So I like caffeine as an example because not only is it, it's not actually a nootropic, um, it's, a, it's a central nervous stimulant, but it's what is a cognitive enhancer. And we're going to look at why cognitive enhancers aren't all nootropics. But uh, the basic idea is that caffeine entered the human kind of uh, society around the 1500s. Tea was 1400s, it's actually not around as long as you think. Um, it was actually in Africa, there's a number of different disputed stories kind of told about a goat herder whose goats were eating the berries and then he, uh, all the goats were crazy, so running around wild, so he started drinking it. Another guy that got banished to the desert and he found coffee and sustained him to get back and it was a miracle. Yada yada yada. So the cost to the in the in the Arab world they don't drink alcohol, and so coffee houses kind of were a big hit there. They got banned. They came back, um, and so as coffee leaves Africa and comes to Europe, it actually makes a huge difference because you have cities and things where people basically they're they're in London, especially big cities like London. The water was all tainted. They knew the water was tainted. They didn't really understand microbes. They, they knew if you boiled stuff where you drank fermented things that you didn't get sick. And fermented drinks and alcohol had come around from when we had berries being carried in jugs and then they were sealed and they basically fermented and we got booze. Uh, we got drunk. And so, but, so coffee was a great sober. It actually like sobered up society, kind of brought us out of the dark ages. And so we can see this quote, coffee, the, the sober drink, the mighty nourishment of the brain, which unlike other spirits, heightens purity and lucidity. Coffee, which clears the clouds of imagination, the gloomy weight, which illum illuminates the reality of things suddenly with a flash of truth. So, and these are like the kind of writings, there's lots of these. This is another one who uh, basically uh, says that now people are civil and they have a, a drink that has pushed society forward. And it's not, just a, it's not just like a theory or whatever, you can actually trace back a conversation to a single coffee shop with a guy had that he brought that same conversation to Newton in another coffee shop and principle uh, one of the most important works where the theory of gravity is in came from there. Lloyd's of London, original trading uh, insurance market was a coffee shop. Um, and so the stock exchange, coffee shops also were these great places because it brought people together from all different classes and different stripes. If you were a sailor, you could meet the businessman. And if you were poor and you couldn't afford uh, to go to the other places, you could just give five cents, you could read the newspapers, all these things. So the people were going to these coffee shops and kind of chatting and having ideas instead of going to dank, dark bars and getting drunk all day. So it really pushed forward. You can read about all the guys in the book. Uh, 
think Voltaire, Black <coughs> Diderot, even Benjamin Franklin was hanging out in Paris, coffee shops and around, and they kind of got lots of ideas, the Enlightenment, and many other uh, kind of gatherings of society around this time started to happen in coffee shops. Isn't this also where like, the first newspapers originated? The first newspapers, yes. There's, <coughs> well, I have those examples, yeah. So the, basically they started, they would use, uh, post. there were like post offices as well, so they would distribute it out to the to the um, people in the, they would say come to the coffee shop and they would print it there and you basically would retrieve it. Some of them are named after that. <laughs> That's the new Jonathan's was the people got banned and then from the coffee shop and then they let them back in. They're like, screw you guys, we're gonna make our own coffee shop called New Jonathan's, which became the stock exchange. <laughs> so, there, yeah. so there was like for each, like it's crazy and I go into it and it basically has like each field in which coffee shop was known for those people. And they would even like categorize like journals and things based on the coffee shop names. It's kind of a crazy system. Because some of these things didn't even have names yet, and they're like, oh, well, all the people in that coffee shop are talking about this weird science stuff or gravity, which didn't have a name. So you have some in very interesting things. So the idea here, and this, this kind of chapter is a bridge to the idea is that the plants could randomly make this molecule that then goes on to power and change our society. That's the exact patient showing we didn't know what was going to happen when caffeine was now distributed to everybody in society, but it allowed for all this kind of uh, innovation. And there, it even comes to the U.S., and it's pretty much on the record in all the writings of uh, the Civil War people. They mention coffee more than they meant, or the buzz from coffee more than they mentioned bullets or anything like that. And so, actually, William McKinley, he was famous for this. Uh, he basically, in the, one of the middle of the battle, he ran the most important coffee run of all time. He ran with coffee across the line and brought it to the soldiers and rejuvenated all of them with the coffee. And then when he ran, was, this was quoted from a general, it was like putting a new regiment in the fight. And they went and won the battle. And so 30 years later, he ran as for president on the coffee story, basically. It was his main claim to fame. And he was president based on the coffee run. First uh, barista president. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> basically, yeah. And so, you know, I kind of go into this, and I found it kind of fascinating, but if you can imagine in the war there, they had like tens of thousands, 20,000 little tiny fires and coffee pots uh, coming up, and that would be the start of the day. And the South was blockaded. There was a whole ocean around the bottom, around the South, and they were drinking like dirt, all these things to like mud, trying to s simulate coffee, but they didn't really know exactly what caffeine was and they didn't know what plants that had it. And so some people say, and I like to believe, that coffee ticked the Civil War in our favor. There was obviously a number of other advantages the uh, North had, but it was uh, something that we can imagine that 90% you know, of Americans consume ca ca caffeine a day, whether in coffee, tea, soda, uh, other drinks and things, so it, it can make a big difference. And so, uh, there you go. So, this is when we start, so that's, you know, 17, uh, 1700s, uh, you know, the time there in the 1870s. So we start to come out of the Civil War, and we are looking, now we're back into Europe, and we're in France. And this is a dress from a French uh, queen, basically. And she, moth, this is a color purple, was a color moth. And so we, all you guys are mostly wearing black, but like a few colors, green and other things around there, but I'm mostly wearing black as well. But Colors were very expensive to create because they came from natural sources. There was no synthetic chemistry. We couldn't make anything. We just had what was there. And so, like, for example, this purple had to be from mollusks, mollusks or uh, beetle shells or a few other sources. And so around the turn of the century here, you've got a guy uh, in England. And England was actually ahead in chemistry. But they didn't really care. It was like a gentleman's thing. You can do some experiment and no one really was putting it into use. And this guy trained there and then he took it to Germany. And in Germany, uh, they went and basically he started trying to make purple. He had a choice to make uh, a cure for malaria from uh, quinine, the bark of a tree, or to make a color. And the guy, fortunately, he chose colors. And luckily, actually, the synthesis of quinine wasn't done until 1944, and it's still more expensive to do it synthetically than to actually get the bark of the tree. So he got lucky. He made. He started trying to make purple. Took off. This is also the time the first fashion magazines were around. Queen of uh, France in a dress of purple spreads to London. It patents. Uh, hey, buddy. And they get the patents and uh, and. Um, <laughs> 
And uh, so they go over to, uh, it's okay. they get the patents, and so then they, it becomes a race to make all these colors. They start saying, what, what other colors do we make? And so these are all from coal tar, so like a hat, like an ash actually has a thing. At some point, um, here's different chemical structures, different colors. This is a red, uh, this is a yellow. Uh, here's the purple that they're kind of making. And so they actually started, if you look at some of the drugs, these are very similar in structure. And so it turned out that some of them had drug properties. I don't know who's going around eating colors, but they found uh, that it had properties. And so these, so it now becomes a race to make each color. Because colors are really in fashion for so long. And so you get two years from purple from red, and they're like, what's the next color? And so this race in uh, Germany specifically, you have these like Bayer and all these other, the, all the German chemical company names that you know, all started in this time. And so there's, and this also, they want to know, so they want the science, they start hiring scientists. It was literally the color red, they were within 24 hours to get to the patent office of each other, and they granted them a tie. And so they started recruiting PhD, like the equivalent of PhDs back then, bringing the universities in, partnering, and that's how you got the industrial drug development process that we still use today. And so in pursuit of fashion, we invented synthetic organic chemistry to make drugs. And so I thought that was really cool. Bayer wins the Nobel Prize in, oops, in, uh, in 1905. And so then we kind of, uh, in the book I go a little bit more into this, but now uh, in this presentation I jump towards uh, what we could do with synthetic chemistry. Because we started kind of uh, maybe making some things that were not uh, very good for us. Um, and so we actually, this is a great book, I recommend this right after you read my book, uh, Blitzed, it's basically about how the Nazis were all on methamphetamine. They were all basically jacked up all the time. Hitler was getting injections of bull testicle extract and like hundreds of things. It's basically World War II told through Hitler's doctor. And so, uh, yeah, I don't want to bring too much into this because it's pretty, it's pretty messed up. But they have uh, methamphetamine basically tells your brain that you're in fight or flight mode. And so these people are literally fighting, and so they had an added advantage the same way the North had caffeine, the Nazis had methamphetamine. And so they were just strung out, and they really didn't care about long-term damage, because most of them were going to die anyway. And so this is kind of where I say, uh, you know, maybe we should be careful what we make and what we're promoting as our society, because you can, uh, you know, drug people and kind of push them to do certain things. So it was called Prevotan was the name of the drug. So now we get to the good stuff. Um, so this is a quote from Ramon Cajal. This He was a, a, a Spanish doctor who in the 18, late 1800s drew the first neuro, neurons. So this is, these are different pyramidal neurons here. These are some of the early pictures. This is actually a self-portrait. This is a selfie of the day. So that's him in his lab. And so he kind of, you know, we got the same idea that any man who was so inclined from the sculpt of his own brain which kind of resonates with me, where we're actually trying to take our own brain. By learning more about the brain, we're then being able to make better drugs for it, and then we can take those better drugs and maybe make even better ones and learn more chemistry and more things. So, was I, he referring to neuroplasticity at the time? He was actually, unfortunately, yeah. if you came by the, in the neurogenesis, when I learned about neurogenesis, he was actually against it, and he kind of said, no new neurons. And that was like okay. a mantra in, in neuroscience until 1998, it wasn't proven that adults make uh, new uh, neurons. It's really messed up. So there's like three different people that had basically brought this to the front and every single time it got tamped back down saying no new neurons, no new neurons. Even one guy, he, the way they figured it out was they got terminal cancer patients and they gave them a radioactive isotope and then they could see that that isotope was in neurons. And so that meant there was new neurons. <coughs> and uh, that basically uh, showed that uh, we were making new neurons and you know, that kind of analogy and that kind of, when I got into that research, it made me so upset because you can see the paper saying, we approve you for this study, but the guy couldn't find somebody who would risk the reputation, his, an advisor, to advise him on the project so he could do the experiment. And so he got excoriated from science, he left, he went into another field, and it was another 20 years until we learned that new neurons do happen. And so that's kind of like in that story I take out, we need to be careful not to, not to be open to new ideas and that nootropics are an idea we should be open to. And so, you guys may not realize this, but we are like very early in the neuroscience world. We're like 60 years in or so. Uh, 1962, the world neuroscience was used for the first time. 
you'd think it's been around for a long time, but no. Uh, we didn't even isolate neurotransmitters like GABA until very recently. Mm -hmm. And so when they found GABA in 1963, um, they found it earlier then, but they didn't know that it was an inhib inhibitory, whereas other neurotransmitters stimulate the brain, and prior <coughs> GABA was the only one known at the time to inhibit. And so scientists in labs all over the world start studying nootropics, or start studying, sorry, start studying GABA, and because it's inhibiting, they think maybe it regulates the brain. And so that's kind of where these scientists at UCB Belgium, they're looking for a, a sleep aid. They start synthesizing, making all these different little modifications to GABA. And you know they have this one was called UCB6215. There was a 1.4 and a 1.6. In drug development, they're just making lines and little modifications. Then they run them through a test. Uh, in this case, they ran them through 30 different psychometric tests. So you had behavioral observations, and so they found no sedation, tranquilization, stimulation, interference with synapses, uh, acute or long-term toxicity, no, like all these, they're like, what the heck is this thing? 30 different tests and no change. Yet, when they put a mouse in, the, in a chamber and then suffocated them, it took 30 minutes normally in control to bring the brain back, only 17 minutes with this thing that would become known as paracetam. And so like, what the heck is this thing? And they kept doing more studies, and uh, here's another great one. So this is, uh, this is a little box here. A rat will always go to a little dark area in a cage. And so they put the rat in this, let him go to this cage. He goes into the, and the light comes on. They lock him in here, the light goes on, and they shock his foot. And then 24 hours later, when they go in this cage, they turn that light on, he gets the heck out of there. So then we're gonna test two different things. Amnesic agent, which would be something like scopolamine, which stops your memories from forming and hypoxia, which is suffocation, which is a simulation of a stroke. Um, that's basically, if you don't know that, a stroke is basically your brain loses oxygen, and uh, you they fire and you get like a fried circuit, basically. Um, so it's, you basically can form no memories uh, in a stroke normally. So when they give the rats uh, paracetam, this is the control, so 100%, when they give the rats the foot shock, and then they suffocate them, they only remember 20% of the time. If they're given paracetam prior, it's over 80%. And so they're like, whoa. And then with the electric shock, they saw 100% retention. So they're like, what is this thing that we can put in the brain, shock the heck out of the rats, and it still remembers? And so they, they're kind of like looking around. This is the EEG. So this is, might have been, Nick, why you failed the thing, because your brain, you aren't used to your brain kind of, this is the normal wave of, this is a cat's brain. This is a wave 60 minutes after taking paracetam. So this is your corpus callosum, mm -hmm. the two sides of your brain that exchange information. So it's a good me metric of how your brain is communicating through the different parts and the different areas and the different sides. And so you can see there's this like, oh, oh, and the one with some of the stronger nootropics are even more profound. And so you can see that there's something going on. And so this guy, Konele Gurdja, from the quote in the beginning, he spent the next uh, like nine years researching and saying, let's look at everything we have in every category in every major system. And so there's a delay Dinecker, which is like basically these ones up here. And he says, here's caffeine and amphetamines, essential nervous stimulants. And he has, and then he adds nootropics down here in its own category. And so you can see here he has methyl, that's why if anyone says that amphetamine is nootropic, it's clearly listed as a stimulant. Um, and nootropics are noted here as noetic telecelephic activators. So that means higher level brain activity. And so, this, in 1972, he comes out with this, uh, the word nootropics comes from new meaning mind, and tropic meaning towards. So he coined an entire uh, category just to describe the, the substance that they had discovered. And so there's some theoretical stuff about where he found it. I chased down the idea of the new sphere, which is kind of like all of the ideas of humanity, our, our brains, like kind of like the internet has we have today, but it was basically all the human knowledge combined with that as the new sphere. And so he kind of took it from this guy, um, and Wilder Pinfield was basically, it's, you know, his quote is one of the citations in his paper. He was the one basically talking about human brain evolution, like back to that first slide where we're saying humans' brains have not changed in the last few thousand years. And now, and we don't have time to wait because we're not going to evolve any differently unless we do something about it and kind of take evolution into our own hands. And so this is the definition of a nootropic. 
They enhance learning and memory. They have few side effects and extremely low toxicity. They protect the brain from physical or chemical injury. They enhance the firing mechanism of higher level neurons. And they prevent disruption of memory formation. So it sounds like a lot, and it is, and there really is nothing else besides this class and paracetam like molecules that have these abilities. And so you can always, just from a toxicity one, eliminate almost every other item like an amphetamine or even a modafinil and things like that because if they have side effects, they're not anotropic. And so I try to keep a very strict definition because there are other categories for other cognitive enhancers. And it's a kind of a one-way street for nootropics. All nootropics are cognitive enhancers, but not all cognitive enhancers are nootropics. And so there is a clear distinction, and that's kind of what I fight for and find why I wrote this book and run the company that I do is to help spread the idea of nootropics as a clearly defined category and to stop people from just calling any little thing a nootropic. I take personal offense. Uh, and so people say, where's the evidence? So where is not the evidence? They literally made fun of nutraceutam and called it a drug in search of a disease because it worked for so many different things. Um, because it was non-toxic and basically passed 98% intact, uh, they felt comfortable putting it into humans of all kinds. This is one of my favorite studies of weird, like weird studies you would never think, was fetal distress during labor. They actually used paracetam versus C-sections, and the babies actually had a better outcome when they were given paracetam instead of the C-section. They actually recovered more quickly. Just like those, those rats whose brain were uh, recovered in 17 minutes versus 30 minutes from suffocation, that's kind of the problem with being premature is they're stuck in there without oxygen and all these other things. And so, you know, there's lots of studies saying we need to move from the question of efficiency and say where is this relevant. And so a lot of the dementia and Alzheimer types, they're sliding off a cliff. And the most, the best research I have on Alzheimer's, which we probably won't call it that name soon because it's maybe more distinct in different kind of things. There's a synaptoclastic to synaptoclastic ratio. So our, in, in Alzheimer's, as we know it, we're destroying more neurons than we're creating. And so we end up losing neurons and kind of having a net loss. And so there's not a lot you can do to stop that slide. And I know a protocol that's 24 different steps, including diet, sleep, nootropics, uh, exercise, all of these things. And they brought back like seven out of the eight people who did in this trial to go back to work. And so it seems like to cure you know, Alzheimer's, you need something, you know, whole body and uh, kind of, that's also where I developed a nootropic protocol, a neutral protocol. But the idea is basically, they didn't work well as the perfect thing in any of these situations. And then we look at 1976, and we see this study, increase in the power of human memory in normal man through the use of drugs. And so they had studies on kids with ADHD and dyslexia, but this study was basically the first one. This started the whole smart drug phase. This was the first time the science leaked out in 1976 saying, hey, we have a drug that if you take this, it actually, I don't think I have the image in this set. Uh, if you take this thing, it actually, it actually will boost your retention, your verbal attention. There's all these different metrics that you can measure, and this one was kind of the first that set the dominoes rolling that brought us to where we are today. And so this here is paracetam, and these are what part two of the book is about, is the discovery of each one of these. So paracetam uh, has evolved out to all of these. So this was levoracetam, and I actually hate this one because it became an anti-epilepsy drug, and the company became a blockbuster company. It was a very specific thing. Didn't have the cognitive enhancing problems, but became a billion dollar drug, and so that company kind of was like, we don't care about this in search, weird in search of a drug molecule. And so, for example, Unifran, this was a guy in a uh, university, in, a scientist in uh, 2000, uh, around 2008, 2007, 2006, who was developing Unifram and Sunifram, named for his university. And so this, We'll jump over and I'm going to talk about basically how I end the book is about what is next and how we kind of got to where we are. Um, and that's basically uh, citizen scientists and people who are taking science into their own hand, experimenting uh, on their own based on reading science and taking the molecules and the doses themselves. And so this is a study from the guy, and he basically gets an email out of the blue years after he published that Unifram and Sunifram molecules, and this guy's telling him, hey, I already take paracetam and all these other nootropics. I found Sunifram on the internet. I'm going to take it. 
what do you recommend the dose? And he's like, writes back, don't take it. I, it's never been tested in humans. I'm not sure of the effects. And so it turns out the guy then emails him, hey, I took it. It worked. I like this dosing. And the guy's like, are you kidding me? And so this, this, this is like from the lab to the web, an academic and industrial shortcoming. So instead of being upset, the guy is basically saying, you know what, if my if, if we government funded our research properly, the university paid more attention to the potential patents. They basically didn't patent them. If at least one company had the foresight to put money in on it, the pharmaceutical industry were more open to outside research. Today, he, we might have more of a medicine and less of a street drug, and he would have made a bunch of money off of it. And so the idea is that we have to make sure you know, that, you know, that we're aware that humans People on the internet are bringing nootropics out into the world, and so you know I'm trying to be responsible about it, make a company, and where you can't really mess up with your dosing or anything. It's you know very simple. It's in a capsule, and so uh, the idea though is that nootropics are here. They're real. They're a uh, you know interesting part in our brain's evolution. They are the most readily, uh, readily available path to increasing our cognitive abilities in a safe and sustainable way. And mind you, there's studies of pre-dementia people 65 and older who are taking 14 different tests, a psychometric test for the brain. After a year, the people on placebo, they go down on eight of the 14, the people on paracetam went down on one. So the basic idea is like you're better off almost taking paracetam than not, especially if you're older. If, you get, if you're gonna get hit in the head going down the street, better to have paracetam. Remember that 80 versus 20 and remembering? So there's an idea is that why are nootropics not out there more, and so that's kind of what I'm working on. Um, and so, and that's it.